All right, let's dive deep today. We're tackling evolution, but not the usual survival of the fittest stuff. You guys requested a deep dive into how it actually, you know, actually works. Like mm -hmm. the nitty gritty, those mechanisms that shape, well, life. You came to the right place. We're going to focus on what we call microevolution, um, the changes within populations. It's it's sort of like we're detectives looking for those shifts, those subtle changes, and then figuring out what's behind them, you know, driving them. Okay, I'm getting out my magnifying glass and deerstalker cap. <laughs> I'm ready to investigate, but uh, where do we even start? Well, our guide for this deep dive is ch23.pdf, which is uh, a ton of research on evolution. And remember those famous Galapagos finches, the ones Darwin studied? Yeah, with all those different beaks. Right the finches. That's microevolution in action. Those beak variations are like clues, you know, to how those finches adapted adapted to their environment. Uh, so we're talking about those changes, <laughs> the actual changes mm -hmm. within a species over time, not just like that grand sweep of evolution over millions of years. Exactly. And to understand these changes, we got to start with the uh, the raw material, you could say, variation. OK, right, right. Because if every creature was identical, there'd be nothing for evolution to work with. But what do we even mean by variation scientifically? So it all comes down to genetic variation, those differences in genes and DNA sequences among individuals. That's why we humans, why we have different facial features, blood types, different shades of hair. It's like those tiny differences in our DNA are what makes each of us unique hmm. and gives evolution something to work with, right? Exactly. Sometimes even a single change in a DNA base pair can have a huge impact. But other times, those tiny changes might not be visible. You know the fruit fly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drosophila melanogaster. Scientists found a ton of variations in their DNA, but a lot of them didn't cause any noticeable differences. It's pretty crazy. Wow, so there's a whole hidden world of genetic variation happening, like, under the surface. Uh, but hold on a second. Does this mean all variation is genetic? You're catching on quickly. There are definitely other factors at play. Remember that caterpillar from the article, the Nemoria arizonaria? Oh, yeah, the caterpillar. These guys change color based on what they eat. What? Same genes, different appearance, all based on their environment. Pretty wild, huh? That is wild. So environment can influence traits, too. Okay. But how do we know if a population is actually evolving? I mean, we can't watch it in real time, right? Not always, no. But scientists have some pretty clever tools. Yeah. Um, one is the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Hardy Weinberg. That sounds kind of intimidating. Is it like a complicated equation? Well, yeah, it is an equation, but um, it's better to think of it as a model. It describes a population that's not evolving. We use it for comparison, a baseline. Ah, so if a population isn't fitting that model, that means something interesting is happening, right? You got it. Well, it basically says in a non-evolving population, the frequencies of alleles and uh, genotypes will stay the same from generation to generation. But if those frequencies do change, well, that's our sign. You know, a sign evolution is at work. Yeah. Okay, so it's a snapshot of a non-evolving population. Then we can look for changes when things, you know, then things get shaken up. And, and this is what's really interesting to me. What are the forces that cause those changes in a population? What's driving this whole, like, evolutionary dance? Well, there are three main ones. Natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. Each of those can shift the genetic makeup over time, sometimes dramatically. Oh, okay. Let's break those down one by one. You know, let's start with the uh, the big one, the one everyone knows, natural selection. Isn't that all about survival of the fittest? Like, you know, the strongest always win. It's more nuanced than that. It's not just surviving. It's about reproductive success. Those individuals that leave the most offspring, they have the greatest impact on the gene pool of the next generation. We have a term relative fitness. So it's a competition to pass on your genes. Yeah. And those who are like better suited to their environment have a better chance of winning that competition. Exactly. And natural selection can act in different ways. Sometimes it favors individuals at one extreme of a trait, like those Galapagos finches with the larger beaks. Oh, right, right. The finches. During a drought, the larger beaks were better for cracking the tough seeds. So advantage, right? Yeah. Those finches had a reproductive advantage. That's called directional selection. You know, it shifts in a particular direction over time. That makes sense. The environment selecting the most beneficial traits. What are some other ways natural selection plays out? Sometimes the environment actually favors both extremes of a trait. The source mentions African seed cracker finches. They have either really large beaks or really small beaks. Each are specialized for different seed types. 
That's disruptive selection. It divides into two distinct groups. So it's creating specialists. That's fascinating. Can selection, can it ever decrease the variation in a population? Absolutely. Think about human birth weight. Babies that are too small or too large have higher risks of complications. So stabilizing selection that favors the average, the middle ground, and reduces the range of variation. Okay, so natural selection can push a population in different directions, or it can maintain stability. It's, it's like a sculpting force constantly. But what about those other forces you mentioned? Genetic drift and gene flow. Those sound like they can shake things up even more. They definitely can. And we'll uh, we'll dive into those right after this. So natural selection is shaping those populations for better adaptation. But sometimes just chance events, those can play a big role, too. That's where genetic drift comes in. Genetic drift. So it's like evolution is uh, rolling the dice. Yeah, you could say that. It's all about random chance, especially in smaller populations. Like, imagine you flip a coin a few times. You might get a streak of heads, even though the odds are 50-50. Something can happen with genes. So even if a trait doesn't, you know, make an organism more fit, it could still become common just by pure luck. Exactly. And there are two, um, two dramatic examples that really show the power of genetic drift. One is called the founder effect. It happens when a small group splits off from a larger population and starts a new one. They might carry a different set of genes just by chance, and that has a big impact on the new population. It's like a small group of pioneers setting off with a limited gene pool. What kind of impact are we talking about? Well, think about that human population on Tristan da Cunha. You know that remote island in the South Atlantic? Oh, yeah. They descended from a small group of founders, right? So they have a high incidence of a rare genetic disorder, retinitis pigmentosa. It's likely one of the original founders carried the gene. And because of that isolation, it just became more common, you know, due to chance. Wow. So even a single individual can really leave a mark, a genetic mark on a population, mm. especially if it's isolated. That's fascinating. And a little uh, a little sobering, what's the other example of genetic drift? It's called the bottleneck effect. It's when a population shrinks drastically, maybe because of a disaster, a natural disaster, mm -hmm. or a disease outbreak. So the surviving individuals might not represent the original diversity, you know, which can lead to some traits being lost altogether. It's like the gene pool got squeezed through a, a narrow bottleneck, and only some of that variation made it through. Are there any real-world examples of that? Sadly, a lot. The article highlights the Illinois greater prairie chicken. Habitat loss really decimated their population, left them with low diversity, and they had terrible hatching rates. Luckily, mm -hmm. conservationists were able to, you know, intervene, <laughs> brought in birds from other states, fresh genes, and the population's recovering slowly. That's a, that's a powerful reminder of how important genetic diversity is for a population's health, its resilience. Okay, so we have natural selection shaping populations for better adaptation, and then we've got genetic drift sort of introducing randomness. What about gene flow? You mentioned that earlier, the last of those big evolutionary forces. Gene flow is all about the movement of genes between populations. Think of it like migration. Individuals move from one place to another and, you know, they bring their genes with them. So it's like evolution is getting a, a fresh batch of ingredients. How does that mixing, that mixing of genes impact populations? It can have a couple effects. Sometimes it increases genetic variation within a population, introduces new alleles that might be beneficial, but it can also work against local adaptation. Remember that Lake Erie water snake example? The ones where the snakes on the islands evolved those different camouflage yes, patterns. Exactly. Island snakes are better camouflaged without bands. But gene flow from the mainland, where banded snakes are more common, it keeps introducing those banded alleles back into those island populations. So it's like a constant push and pull, right? Mm -hmm. Between adapting to that local environment and then the homogenizing force of gene flow. It's like evolution is trying to find a balance maintain local adaptations, and keep that gene pool diverse. It shows how interconnected populations are, even when they're geographically separated. Okay, so we've covered those three major forces, natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. It feels like a, like a very intricate dance. But I have a question. If natural selection is making organisms better suited to their environment, why aren't all adaptations perfect? Shouldn't everything be you know, perfectly streamlined and efficient after millions of years. 
That's a great question. It gets to the heart of what evolution is really about. It's not about perfection. It's about being, well, good enough to survive and reproduce. There are limitations to what natural selection can achieve. Limitations. Even evolution has constraints. Tell me more. Well, one thing, natural selection can only work with what's already there. You know, the variation within a population. It can't just create new traits out of thin air. It's like building a house with only the materials you have on hand, you know, right. limited by what's available. So if a population doesn't have the right genes for a certain adaptation, they're out of luck. Yeah, that can happen. The article mentions the snowshoe hair. They usually change from brown to white in winter for camouflage. But with climate change, the snowfall's happening later, right? Some haven't evolved to delay their molting, so they're stuck with white fur on bare ground. That's a, that's a sad example. But it really shows how evolution can lag behind when the environment changes rapidly. What are some other constraints? Well, historical constraints are a big one. Evolution builds on existing structures. It's like um, renovating a house. You can remodel, but you're working within that existing framework. Adaptations are often modifications, not totally new inventions. So it's more like evolution is repurposing and tweaking. I like that analogy. Mm -hmm. What else? What other limitations are there? Adaptations are often compromises. A trait that's good in one context, it might be a problem in another. Think about seals. Flippers are great for swimming, but they're clumsy on land. It's a trade-off. Ah, uh, like trying to design a tool that can do everything. It might not be great at anything. Exactly. And lastly, we have to remember that chance, you know, natural selection and the environment, they all interact. It's complex. Random events can happen. And environments are always changing. Evolution is dynamic, not a straight line towards, you know, perfection. It sounds like evolution is playing this high stakes game with like, a constantly changing rule book. So that explains why there's so much diversity in nature, I guess. So we've talked about how natural selection favors certain traits, but wouldn't that mean eventually every individual would have those, those best genes? Wouldn't we lose all that variation? That's a common thought, but it turns out there are mechanisms that actually maintain that diversity within a population. We call that balancing selection. Balancing selection. So evolution is trying to keep things diverse. Why would it be? Diversity is essential for survival. Long-term survival, I mean. One way it achieves this is through frequency-dependent selection. The fitness of a trait depends on how common it is in the population. Wait, so being rare can actually be an advantage. That doesn't make sense. It can. Think about those scale-eating fish in Lake Tanganyika. The article mentioned them. Some have mouths that twist to the left, others to the right. Let's them sneak up and steal scales from other fish. Oh, that's sneaky. But what does mouth direction have to do with rarity? The prey fish, they learn to watch out for attacks from whichever mouth type is more common, right? Right. So the rarer one has an advantage. They're less predictable. It leads to this constant back and forth in the population. The rarer type always has higher fitness. It's like a, like a game of rock, paper, scissors. Never ending. What's the other mechanism that maintains diversity? Heterozygote advantage. Individuals with two different alleles for a gene have higher fitness than those with two of the same allele. The sickle cell allele in humans, that works this way, right? You got it. Having two copies of the sickle cell allele, that causes the disease. But having just one copy provides some protection against malaria. So in areas where malaria is common, those heterozygotes have an advantage, less susceptible to both. It's like this balancing act where evolution favors diversity even when, you know, even when certain alleles can be harmful. Exactly. Heterozygote advantage keeps that genetic variation going, even if it seems, you know, a little counterintuitive. Speaking of diversity, there's another aspect of evolution we need to explore. Sexual selection. Oh, things are about to get interesting. I've always wondered about those, uh, those extravagant traits, the ones that seem to make animals more vulnerable, like the peacock's pale feathers. Why would evolution favor something that basically screams, hey, look at me, mm -hmm. to predators? Good question. Sexual selection is all about traits that increase an individual's chance of finding a mate, reproducing. And sometimes those traits, yeah, they seem to go against the idea of survival of the fittest. So it's not always about blending in and avoiding danger. Sometimes it's about standing out, attracting attention. Right. Sexual selection works in two main ways. Intrasexual selection is competition within a sex, usually males competing for females, like stags with their antlers or elephant seals fighting for dominance. Like a, uh, like a gladiatorial arena for love. What about the other type? Intersexual selection, also called mate choice. 
Individuals of one sex, usually females, they're choosy about their mates. They might be drawn to, like, elaborate displays, you know? Bright colors, intricate dances, complex songs. Like the females are judging a talent show, looking for the best performers. Yeah. But why would those flashy traits be attractive, you know, if they make the males more vulnerable? One idea is those traits are honest signals, honest signals of good genes. If a male can survive, even though he's got this bright, attention-grabbing trait, it might mean he's got other good genes too. Contributes to his overall fitness. Like a, like a genetic guarantee, choose me, I have the best genes. Mm -hmm. The article talked about an experiment with gray tree frogs, right? Yeah. Females prefer males with longer mating calls. Researchers found that the offspring of those males actually had higher survival and growth rates suggests that call duration is a good indicator of genetic quality. So the females are onto something with their preferences. Those displays aren't just for show. Okay, we've covered a lot today, from those forces of change to, um, to the mechanisms that keep that diversity going. It's mind-boggling how complex and interconnected it all is. It is. And remember, all this knowledge has real implications. Understanding how evolution works, it's crucial for tackling things like antibiotic resistance, conserving endangered species, even understanding diseases. It's not just theoretical, it's really relevant to our lives. That's a that's a great point. Evolution's happening all around us constantly. But before we, you know, before we wrap up our evolutionary journey, I have one last question. We've talked a lot about how nails are often the ones with the flashy displays. But what about species where the females compete for the males? Mm -hmm. How would their, you know, their secondary sex characteristics, how would those differ? That's a fantastic question and a great way to um, a great way to end our deep dive. In those cases, you might see the females evolving traits that help them compete, increased size or strength, even aggression. Uh, imagine, you know, female birds with brighter plumage than the males, or female mammals with big antlers. Whoa! Evolutionary role reversal. It's amazing to think about. Just shows that nature is full of surprises. There's always more to discover. Understanding evolution helps us appreciate the incredible diversity of life and those processes that shaped it over, you know, over millions of years. It's been an amazing journey. Thanks for taking us on this deep dive into the world of evolution. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. And to all our listeners, thanks for diving deep with us. We'll see you next time for another, you know, another fascinating exploration. You know, that image of, of female birds with brighter plumage, that's really stuck with me. It's like evolution's always throwing us curveballs. It is. And, you know, as we wrap up, I think it's important to to connect this knowledge back to the real world. It's not just theory. It really has implications for our lives. That's true. We've been talking big picture. But how does this how does evolution actually play out in our lives day to day? I mean, well, for example, think about antibiotic resistance. Bacteria, they're constantly evolving. And the ones with mutations, the ones that make them resistant, well, they survive, right? reproduce more successfully. It's like a, a constant arms race. So understanding evolution, that helps us develop better strategies uh, to, you know, to slow down that resistance. Exactly. Knowing how bacteria evolve, it helps us make more effective treatments, use antibiotics more carefully, preserve their effectiveness longer. That's, that's huge for public health. Mm. What about other areas where understanding evolution is important? Conservation is a big one. We talked about how genetic drift can reduce variation, and that makes populations more vulnerable to, you know, disease, environmental change. So conservation efforts, those often focus on maintaining gene flow between those fragmented populations. It's about boosting their diversity, their resilience. It's not just protecting species. It's protecting their, their evolutionary potential yeah. for the future. Yeah. And even in medicine, understanding evolution is helping us understand diseases. Cancer, for example. Cancer cells are essentially cells that have evolved, right? To grow out of control, evade the body's defenses. So by studying that, that evolutionary history, we can maybe develop better treatments. Wow. So evolution is really tied to, to our well-being. Hmm. From fighting disease to, to preserving biodiversity, it's not just an abstract concept. It's a force that really shapes our world. Couldn't agree more. It's a continuous process, you know. It's happening all around us, shaping life for, well, for generations to come. I hope this deep dive gave you a new appreciation for for the beauty, the complexity of it all. It has. I feel like I have a whole new perspective on, on life huh? and how it changes. Who knows what other discoveries are out there? That's the best part. There's always something new to discover. And I want to encourage everyone listening to keep exploring Keep asking questions, you know, keep your eyes open for those, those signs of evolution. 
all around you, the subtle ones, the not so subtle ones. That's that's a great point. Thank you again for joining us on this this incredible journey into the world of evolution. It's been my pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you for diving deep of us. We'll see you next time for another fascinating exploration.